Hey, what's going on guys? Griffin Gaming RPG back again. It's been a little while, but I'm dropping in this week to do something a little bit different. Um, we're doing Star Citizen 101, uh, and for those of you who've been here before, you know that this is basically a time where hopefully I answer some questions uh, from folks who want to know more about Star Citizen. Uh, I'm not an authority <laughs> on Star Citizen, uh, but I have been following it for a few years now, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to answer some basic and emphasize basic questions for those who may be interested in Star Citizen and wanting to know a little bit more about it. Uh, today what we want to do is basically go back and actually take a trip back to the beginning and uh, find out how Star Citizen, Star Citizen came about. Uh, what I hope to do is show you some videos uh, by Chris Roberts, uh, the developer and producer of the game, uh, and basically hear from uh, Chris himself uh, what brought him to bringing Star Citizen about, uh, the process of bringing it to where it is today. Uh, and also to encourage uh, those Star Citizen fans out there. I know there's a little bit of frustration sometimes. We're, we're all waiting on the next update of 2.5 to be released, which is very, 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 very imminent. Uh, so in the meantime, it's kind of good to go back and, and kind of remind ourselves of why we got excited about this game. So uh, I'm going to be starting out uh, right at the very beginning with one of the first uh, videos that we saw put out by Cloud Imperium Games uh, with Chris Roberts talking about... Uh, uh, Star Citizen and his vision for what the game would be about and hopefully um, for the time we'll be here I'm going to progress through a couple of the videos. There'll be an interview uh, with John Rice Davies and um, also with um, Mark Hamill uh, with Chris and then finally uh, the most recent interview that was done by PC Gamer in Germany with Chris as well and that video has been kind of circulating over the past day or two. I was really impressed by it and I wanted to show it again for those people who may not get a chance to see it. So hey thanks for dropping in with me. I appreciate you hanging out with me this Saturday uh, morning or afternoon or evening depending on where you might be and uh, let's get started. We'll go ahead and get the videos going and uh, we'll see what happens from here. If you have any questions, feel free to type them in, and hopefully um, I'll be able to respond to them. I am a space sim. Hi, I'm Chris Roberts. Ever since hey, I saw Star Wars as a wide-eyed eight-year-old, I dreamt of being a hotshot pilot saving the galaxy or a lovable rogue making my way across the cosmos. It inspired me to make Wing Commander and has influenced everything I've done since then. Ten years ago, after 20 years of making games, I was burned out so I took a break. But I never stopped playing games nor loving them. And now, I'm ready to come back. And I'd like to show you something I've been working on. But I don't want to build any old game. I want to build a universe. I want to build a game I always wanted to build, but I didn't have the tools to do until now. One that you can fly off a carrier fighting heroic war on the front lines, but also one that you can muster out and find your own fortune in the stars wherever your spaceship takes you. I want to be able to share this One of the things about Chris, whenever he's friends, talking, standing up, he always uses his hands. Space, not just AI. <laughs> and I want this to be as good or better than any other game out there. And I want to actively push the boundaries of what you can do in a game. None of this would have been even possible two years ago. 
but with Moore's Law driving PC performance and cost and the gaming community embracing talented developers via crowdfunding, I believe it is possible today. I've never been accused of having a small vision, and so I thought it was best if I share my ambition with you visually. I'm pretty excited by how it's joined out, so why don't you come join me for a sneak peek. Sneak peek. So I want to bring the space sim back. I want to bring the space sim back to the glory that it used to be in the 90s when I was making the Wing Commanders and when I was doing games like Privateer and Freelancer. But I want to utilize today's technology. I want to have the power of a cutting edge PC with a GPU that can push millions of polys, uh, connected to the broadband where you can play with uh, thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of other people around the world. Uh, in a sort of shared immersive experience. And now I think with Star Citizen, I really can deliver that. We're going for something that's a little bit different than, say, a traditional MMO, and obviously different than just a single player game. What we're calling is a shared persistent experience. It is actually a combination of the single player experience and the multiplayer experience. Every player in the Star Citizen game is in the same universe. We don't have different shards or worlds. And you have a life, you have a character, you have multiple characters, they have multiple ships. So you have a bigger goal, you're, you're basically going about making your name and fortune in the galaxy. So Squadron 42 is the single player experience in the Star Citizen game and world, and Star Citizen itself is the multiplayer persistent universe experience where uh, you'll adventure around in a galaxy with hundreds, thousands, potentially millions of other players. They both kind of coexist in the same world. So Squadron 42 is a narrative single player story that will lead you into the open sandbox game that Star Citizen is. So the single player campaign in Squadron 42 unfolds very similar to the way Wing Commander did. So Wing Commander was set up in such a way that depending on how you performed the missions or how you interacted with your wingmen and pilots, it would determine uh, sort of how the story evolved. So your actions sort of- Who remembers Wing Commander? <laughs> We're doing that in Squadron 42 to a level of- I remember that. More than we ever did in Wing Commander. So, Definitely your actions will evolve, affect and evolve how the story goes, as well as how your relationships with your co-pilots are uh, and other people aboard the carrier that you're based on. One of the things I'm most excited by uh, are the hands again. 42, and one of the things that we're sort of adding to the lexicon of the Wing Commander experience is that we're enabling cooperative multiplayer in the single player experience. So, uh, as long as you're connected online, your friends say in your friends list that are, you know you know in the community, you interact with on our, uh, on our website, they can drop in to your game if you want them to and play the roles of the wingmen and the missions you're taking and help you achieve your goals and missions. But I just think it adds a whole new dynamic to um, the narrative in uh, a game like Squadron 42. So I think it will be a really cool feature. If you like Wing Commander as a single player experience, uh, Squadron 42 is like the next generation of that. The ambition and the scope of Star Citizen makes it pretty unique in the fact that I think we're starting with at least 100 star systems, and each star system can have multiple planets, each planet can have multiple landing locations, and all of that sort of rendered nice. still in a, a completely sort of high fidelity first person viewpoint. So when we're down on the planet, we're running around in first person. We can go into the bar and we see other AI characters, um, and we can talk and converse with them and get missions. We can walk out of there, go to the ship dealer and buy a new ship. We can walk the landing pad where your ship's sitting and get into it all in first person, sit down in the cockpit, take off, go out into space. So there's a level of sort of detail and fidelity that I don't think is currently out there in other space games, certainly right now. One of the great things about Star Citizen is there are a lot of different roles you can play in it. You can be a mercenary, you can be a bounty hunter, you can be a merchant trader, you can be a pirate. And we've designed and built a lot of different ships to sort of fill those roles. Freelancer. Can, you know, this ship's good for dogfighting. This ship's good for hauling cars. I-315P, Starfarer. Buy, or you can find, or you can acquire, or you can upgrade in the game that will allow you to customize your ship for the roles you want to play. I think that's one of the most exciting parts of the game is just that sort of free form and the amount of different things that you can do. And that's kind of what Star Citizen's about. And so I really felt I wanted to come back and make a game that pushed PC hardware in the way that Wing Commander used to do in the old days. Pirates and Ace PCs are going to allow me to do a much more... You're going to definitely have to do that. <laughs> if you got an old computer, guys, you're going to have to build a big one. Fidelity will just allow more functionality, a lot more detail in terms of the ships, so we can simulate the systems and the physics in a way that we never could before because we just didn't have the processing power. So we're supporting an Oculus Rift, which is this great VR headset. That's the sort of stuff that you just don't see happen uh, frequently sort of in the console world. PCs in my DNA, I think it's the most interesting platform because it's always evolving, it's always challenging you, and it's going to allow us 
in three or four or five years' time to do totally different things with uh, Star Citizen because you know the hardware will move along and we can we can push it even further. If you love space sims, you love PCs, and you feel like this kind of game needs to happen more often, I bet you now you're helping it happen. But more importantly to that, if you've ever wondered how games are made, uh, what's happening, by doing it now you're going to participate in that, you're going to see it. We have multiple updates um, you know, on our dedicated site, uh, the robertspaceindustries.com site, uh, where we're describing what we're doing, what we're doing this week, how we built this ship, how we built this character, what our thinking is on this game mechanic or that game mechanic. So it's a real sort of insider's, behind the scenes uh, view of the game development process. On top of that, beyond all this stuff I've talked about, uh, we're going to be releasing parts of the game, modules of the game along the way. We're going to release the hangar module that is in August of 2013. I remember that. And that module will allow that was you real to basic hangar. walk around the ships that you've backed or pledged on the site, in the engine, see what they are, get inside them, check them out. Um, ultimately, you're going to enable multiplayer where other players can come in and check out your hangar. Uh, you can customize your hangar. This is well. you'll be able to customize your ships eventually. And then in December, we're going to have the dogfighting module, which will be just standalone dogfighting in space. You can take the ships you have in your hangar and fight against other players, you know, sort of more traditional deathmatch, uh, you know, matchmaking, uh, or against AI. And you can practice and hone your dogfighting skills and give us valuable feedback in the balancing of the ships and the weapons. We can see how many players in one area is fun. So if you want to be playing parts of the game, seeing how the game is developed, having your voice heard and having your feedback, then I mean, you should you should join now rather than wait. Zoom. Awesome. So that's our first video. Um, and um, I'm going to actually do a quick adjustment here on something. So guys, bear with me because I don't have all of the screen capture in here like I really, really want to. So let me let me do this, redo this one more time and put it in the right way. Sorry about that. I thought I had the thing measured out right the first time, but I think I must have moved it or something or resized it. So let me get it all in here so we're getting all of its glory. <laughs> Again, if you guys have any questions about Star Citizen, hey, definitely throw them at me. And um, hopefully I'll be able to answer them for you. So let's go on to our next video. Here we go. Let's see. We did that one. And this one's next. Here we go. How did we get here? The story so far. This is actually a timeline showing how uh, Star Citizen progressed through its development process. So. so I'm going to build a universe. I'm going to do a PC game like the old Wing Planners I did, which was if you've got a great PC, this is really going to show it off. You're not going to be able to get this experience anywhere else. I'm hoping that a lot of you want to be in this universe, because I do, and I want to play this game. 2012, that was the announcement, October. A lot of people talk about the fact that, oh, this game's been in development for four years. It really hasn't. It just wait, wait, got announced in 2012. First office opens February 2013. you can see the huge staff, right? <laughs> so obviously we don't staff of 32. So in here is my office and the, the idea is to try and have an open work environment so everyone can communicate and talk to each other and, and then it's Staff goes up to 40. So this is the uh, basic hangar. That was the first time we saw the hangar modules. Foundry 42, that's a studio in the UK. Thank you. 
That's uh, Chris Roberts' brother, Aaron. He oversees Foundry 42. Folks in Austin, Texas. Doing some upgrades to their studio. Got 60 staff so far at that point. So these are the different TV shows that they introduce. Hello everyone, so this is the uh, inaugural uh, tent for the chairman. Tent for the chairman. But congratulations guys, you're Next great starship. So those are all the ways they keep in touch with the community. Welcome to the new office. Um, we are really excited to be here, uh, settling in. And what I want to do now is introduce you to some of the guys. It's Aaron Roberts again. Here's the dogfighting module, Arena Commander. Yeah. The old helmet flip. So now the staff is up to 156 in 2014. The new hangers that we got. Arrowview, Revel in York. Ah, and the racetrack. Here's the Frankfurt, Germany offices come online February 2015. Office space that we're in here in Frankfurt. This one? Uh, current office space. <laughs> Welcome to Ealing Studios in London, England, and we're doing amazing things with both Star Citizen and Squadron 42. It's not financed by some big corporation, it's not financed by some big investor, it's financed by all of you out there. And I'm looking forward to showing you stuff uh, from Squadron 42 and Star Citizen uh, as we develop it. It's the first time we see the multi-crew, this is actually pretty cool. Corp. Now we're on the station. It was the first time we saw the demo of multi-crew where there were like five or six people who got on different ships and took off together and did a real short mission. It was pretty cool. Again, we're just doing um, some reviews, some videos with Chris Roberts from Star Citizen. If you have any questions, feel free to type them in. Thanks for hanging out with me. Okay, so that's another video that we're going to take a look at, and we're going to move on now to another video that I found, and actually this is one that I had not uh, seen myself until just recently. Uh, it's an interview with Mark Hamill, John Rice davies and Chris Roberts, and um, actually it's pretty interesting. I haven't, hadn't seen this one before, so hopefully you'll enjoy it.
Auf Zwick. Ladies and gentlemen, witness now as I try to do my best impression of a professional journalist who can hold it together while I sit next to the stars of Star Citizen of Star Citizen Sport 42, Mark Hamill, the director, Chris Roberts and John Rhys Davis and my God, <laughs> I'm a little starstruck, um, but wh how was your day today? Like every other day, it's always different. It's a different challenge every day. We have so much fun. Uh, you know, I think uh, the fact that there's sort of a lighthearted spirit behind it all takes away a lot of the pressure because the, the, the amount of dialogue you have to learn is just massive. And it's not like an ordinary play or movie, you know, this is the kind of dialogue you never say in real life. <laughs> But, uh, well, you sounded like the Joker when you laughed there for a minute. <laughs> time every day and an honor to work with an actor like I don't know, when you, when you see uh, Mark Hamill, do you think of, one of Luke Skywalker or the and, Joker? Uh, Which I one? I thought I'd get the chance to work with him again, so, <laughs> you know, it's just been a... We're a, a, a mutual admiration society. We, uh... We had a lot of fun on that first film that you had us in, Chris, and, uh, and it's, it's marvelous to be back again, and uh, still romping around in spandex and pretending. And um, that's another question, if the shoot's finally gonna, gonna wrap up, what will be the thing you're going to miss the least about shooting on, in the mocap set? The, that I'm gonna miss the least? Uh, no problem. Gosh. Well. Uh, Thanks for hanging out, Def. Appreciate it. Of getting used to those outfits. There's no dignity there. You look like sort of a, a there's, there's a penguin-like quality. And, but it's, it, like I say, it's very democratic. Everyone looks exactly the same, whether you're the, a leading actor or a background artist. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I enjoy it all. Like I, like I say, it's exhausting. And uh, as soon as we finish this, I'm going to have to start memorizing tomorrow's lines. But uh, it's all worth it. The headset, right? I mean, you got the, the headset. Um, the headset's probably that's. I would um, not that I have to wear it all the time, but I think that's fairly heavy. So it, it and the backpack's fairly heavy. So I think that's probably physically. You yeah. never really get used to it. I know it was particularly annoying you the other day. I know. I know. It, it's either. It's either too loose and therefore constantly flopping down, or if it's tight enough, it's like a steel band around your head. You know? <laughs> First impression when I walked on set was it like a contraption from the Saw movies. <laughs> yeah, I definitely would do the, the uh, episodes here. I'm, we're going to spend some time to try and get a better, um, like, nicer fit helmet, because that was, I would say, I'm actually amazed that the, uh, yeah. I don't, to me it doesn't feel like it affects anyone's performance, but I definitely know that it, you know, between the takes, everyone's like, uh, you know, this is, this is tight, and when I've tried it on, like, oh, this is pretty heavy, uh, but I think what it is, I think when you get into the moment, you're in the moment, right. and then afterwards, between the takes, it's like, oh, yeah. this is a bit tight for me, let me adjust it, but, yeah, I would say that's probably the physically tough one. When you watch the DVD D extras on the Planet of the Apes movies, or Avatar, and you think, well, I'd really like to try that sometime. Just because it's something I've never done, you know, it wasn't uh, that way when we were doing Wing Commander. Uh, and it has its own set of problems, but like Chris says, it's uh, it's the same basic uh, skills you use in any medium. So it's it, as as unusual as it is, it's uh, it's strangely familiar. Yes, it is. But. But some of the rules that you that you've learned as a screen actor just don't work. Um, I, I still do not understand, Chris, how it can be that I'm walking in a big circle like this because I said it's too small, and you are digitally going to have us walking in a straight down line <laughs> down this <laughs> five kilometer long. Because well, we have all, we have everything we have all your motions and we have what you're talking all in 3D. So we can actually sort of adjust your direction to be straight instead of circular. But I actually, you know, long term we do episode two. We're going to shoot on a bigger stage because it's. Uh, I prefer to. I would prefer to have more space to play in because it's just anyway. It's just easier to play rather than have to think about other technical things like oh, I'm going to run out of the volume and I need to start turning around. Uh, but we, you know, yeah, you can fix a lot of it because you basically the the advantage is you get everybody 
like everybody's body, where all the motions are all in 3D, plus the plus what's happening on your face, all in 3D, and so then you can you can literally manipulate it uh, any way you want. Um, That's other cool. Than the issue is that the more you want to diverge from what you shot, it just is going to take a little longer to to get it to that. So generally, you want to try and shoot something that is close to what you're going to put into the game. And what they can do, we were sitting. <coughs> learning our lines and Ian Duncan was playing the player said hey look at the monitor because we were just in two uh, folding chairs and we looked over at the monitor oh, yeah. and Hannes had us sitting on a big white comfy sofa <laughs> I guess he was just bored and uh, yeah. decided to no, Han that. Hannes has a good fun he's just sits there because he sets the scene up just to block the stuff out and then when he set it up uh, then he starts uh, yeah like when people are, like when you're off in the back he always puts couches there that, uh, dresses it around just for can that. he make me look tall that's he the can. key question really he can, All right. totally. he can. make he... me look more like Brad Pitt come on <laughs> while he's at it now in the game the player has the possibility to affect the way the story goes how's that for you as actors is that an interesting concept to always um, reinsert yourself in a certain point in the story and have it play another way or would you prefer it if the story would go in one predefined path i remember being in grade school and discovering those books that would say if you want the detective to go to the attic turn to page such and such if you want him to go in the basement and i loved that concept even as a kid i thought wow i can control the storyline to some extent so to take it to the The, the lengths that they've achieved here is just mind-boggling. It's it's got to be a, a great great adventure for someone to be. A, he's the leading. The player will be the starring role in this in this storyline. It's first person and uh, that's cool. Uh, unprecedented, as far as I know. But you can only address the player directly in certain situations. If Uh, as I did, I, I think the, yesterday when I, you know, I, I make my confession of how uh, you know, how wrong I'd been, and then I, instead of finishing it off talking to Mark, I suddenly talked to the player, and this might present a problem. It might not be usable at that point because the player could be behind or any other part, and you know, just getting well, ahead. Yeah, that, that's. I mean, that's part. Of, I mean. So we have stuff that, like, when you talk to the player, we don't know if the player's going to be here or the player's going to be there. So we, you know, like, you'll play it to Ian as playing the player, and we'll know in 3D space that's where he was when he did it. So if we actually the player in the game is over here, we can sort of turn your head and your eyes to be over <laughs> there and perform the journey the same on the face. That's amazing. But, yeah, if he's, like, literally right behind you, then that's a problem because he can't. I mean, you can pretty much do that <laughs> without that. Um, so probably what would happen in the case of the player was off the line play it over your shoulder or we may just play it straight ahead but yeah there's that's some of the sort of R&D and tech that we're working on to sort of take the performance and the essence of the performance but also occasionally have some level of what you call procedural um, manipulation on top so you account for where the player is because you know you, if you played this way and the player standing over there it would look really silly right so <laughs> so basically we would just move the head there and you play that way and so really if you think about it like when you move it's like really what will be will be your head and your eyes because the rest of all this if you actually look on those cameras if you actually look at them as they move around it's fixed your head most of all this all plays exactly the same it's really where your eyes go and where your head turns and so that's so once we know that we can, we can sort of translate it appropriately to the player you can always go back and do it again i mean i i was telling you today that my boys were playing nathan would be trying to do his best and griffin just to be contrary would do completely wrong things just to see what would happen no no, no, no. what if i do what the opposite of what my instincts tell me because he knows that he can go back and no, i'm sure if your sons play spider before you say they'll just have great delight in hanging out and seeing how many times you can bark at them because we have we have this we have this joke that so ian uh duncan who's playing the player is you know a lot of times we can't control what the player's going to do and you know so a lot of players will just not do something or you know they'll be off making a tea or coffee or something and come back so we have cases where pretty much all the time the player like you get into an elevator and then you're like are you gonna come hey kid come on let's go kid we're really waiting for you and so <laughs> such a nice. it's like it's like the rule of three and so we actually have this joke with ian that like uh who's playing the player that like he you know 
we always have to sort of tell him three times. So even like outside of work, if we're like going to dinner or text him like, hey, we're outside in the car. No, Ian, we're really outside in the car. <laughs> Ian, get your ass out here. And then finally he texts back, okay, I'm on my way. And that's what happens on the set. I mean, it ha like without fail, every scene, it's like the rule of three. You've got to get there and then there's like, three prompts and then finally the player goes and does something and of course hopefully the player is not going to be like that but the way we shoot it we have to capture the extra options from and i'm sure there'll be plenty of players that will just do it just to see what the different line readings are yeah, which probably sure. will be your, your kids <laughs> well then i should do some wild lines like clean up your room <laughs> take out the trash yeah we like detect you can find out okay yeah, all right this is, this especially triggers and it's like an easter egg right. what wait right. <laughs> So now you have the two stars of the Wing Commander game back in Squadron 42. Was there any other Wing Commander thing you would have liked to bring back but couldn't due to legal reasons or something like that? Uh, well, I mean, you know, other than doing Wing Commander, I mean, uh, no, no, I mean, uh, for me, uh, you know, Squadron 42 is like a spiritual successor to what I was doing Wing Commander, and all the things I'm doing are the things I would be doing if I was doing another Wing Commander. Uh, but it's kind of fun doing it in a sort of fresh new world because you know the wing commander story we had this whole arc and story so if i went back to do it again i'd sort of be going back and you know doing one of those classic uh you know a re you know back to the beginning re yeah. you know remake kind of things and uh so this isn't really this it, it, but it's taking sort of that the essence and so it's kind of i mean for me uh i always wanted to sort of take so there's definitely nods to it and and uh you know i had such a great time making Three and four with Mark and John, and actually most of the other cast. Um, but in this particular case, I was sort of casting to what made sense for the Squadron 42 story. And so, the case of um, you know Commander Lieutenant Commander Steve Carlton, who's Paul Sign's old man, and and Graves, uh, you know they they both serve together. So we're just, I'm just like that's totally perfect because it's like okay, you know Chris Blair and Paladin both serve together. They were friends. They were sort of you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, kind of peers of each other and had this mutual respect. And so it'd be nice to take that sort of relationship, uh, you know, back into Squadron 42. And so that was kind of why I sort of zoned in on, on Mark and John, because it sort of felt like they were right for those particular roles that would be uh, you know, in the game. And I just thought it'd be really great, like in the case of, uh, you know, Old Man, is he's, he's really the mentor of the player and he stays with the player. Um, as we go through episode one and, and, and further and like yeah it's, it's sort of almost like okay this is great because it's like you know, I you know in the early Wink Manor days I was sort of uh, you know he was playing who you were playing but now it's almost better because you get to get into the you get to sort of be in the game yourself fully immersed in 3D and you've got Mark right there saying okay now you know All right kid come on let's go or you know quit move up or you know fly your ship better or whatever you sort of it sort of feels like you're right next to <coughs> Mark and you know the same for John it's like you're just going to be there and I think you'll feel like you're in the in in this movie versus watching a movie sounds cool and, uh, that's kind of what I'm pretty excited about it's kind of pretty cool I mean that'd be my dream when I you know I was a little wee lad and I went and saw Star Wars and I went oh, I want to be in that universe <laughs> so I'm just trying to be enable careful that what you wish for <laughs> So one last question. You guys worked with Chris before back uh, on Wing Commander all these years ago. How has he changed as a director? Well, you know, he always had a firm grasp of everything we needed to know. He's very specific. He's, uh, you know, uh, he knows what he wants and, and, and he has a very light touch. I mean, it's it's not like you're browbeaten or intimidated by you know his presence and I look to him he's like a guru I mean if it weren't for him I wouldn't know where I was and uh, we just have a great working relationship I, I never expected to to go to be able to go back you know that ship had sailed you um, did the movie and uh, I think Freddie Prince played me yeah, yeah, that wasn't my, but yeah, that was, I mean, Freddie's really nice and really great, but that's great like, guy. It's, that, it's that typical wing, uh, typical studio thing where it's like, they're all like, well, you know, we've got to, it's for the kids, you got to get, you got to, you got to cast young, okay, everyone wants, you know, this is, this is, you know, I think it was, uh, I, I can't remember which, you know, it was like, there was a, there was this whole phase of like these uh, sort of horror movies, and yeah, yeah. Freddie was in a pretty big one, and he was just up and down, so I think you got to, Young. And I think that, you know, 
uh, in some ways that's kind of what's um, a bit of a bummer about the movie business is because you get uh, decisions that get made that may be the core fan I mean look hey look speaking of other things Star Wars is getting remade now and not remade they're doing the episodes and you know what's happening everyone's but I did a little vocal cameo. I'm no, you did. No, you, 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 you played Merlin. But I mean, I'm just saying that for me, it was like it wasn't necessarily like what's nice about doing what I'm doing here is I sort of get to make the calls. And the case of the Wink Runner movie, I had to sort of do kind of what Fox wanted. But it's almost analogous uh, it's to Star Wars movie, because yeah. you know that franchise went back in time uh, to the days when they were in flight training. Of course, the Star Wars uh, episodes went to the prequels and my wife's saying can you pick one franchise that benefits us chronologically <laughs> uh, but uh, and, and I never expected it that's what's so much fun is yeah. it's it's like pulling out an old pair of trousers you haven't worn in years and finding a $20 bill in the pocket it's it's more valuable than any other $20 because it was unexpected so you know I never really thought about it I do always look back on the experience with great fondness but I never in a million years expected that to, to, for, for it to happen. So it's a delight to be back. So John, do you remember any differences um, with Chris? Mm -hmm. Yes, I was just thinking about that. I think 20 years ago, he was a young director. 20 years ago, wow. A game who really understood his game and was just beginning to tentatively become the film director. Now he is again state-of-the-art, cutting-edge director of the game, but he's also now a very accomplished film director. And, you know, his confidence is, is there, and because his confidence is there, he's, he is, he's now, I suspect that 20 years ago we intimidated him slightly because we were actors, and he probably hadn't had too much experience of dealing with actors. Now, he's a very accomplished director, and, and he realizes now that we're the ones who are a little bit intimidated because, you know, there we are in spandex, <laughs> prancing around, and we haven't a clue. And he's like a sort of father to us now, <laughs> mentoring us and getting a performance out of us and patting us and reassuring us. <laughs> it's a joy. Uh, well, I, let's see. On my side, I mean, uh, I know I definitely think I'm better now, mainly because I'm I'm older, right? So there's a as you be, as you and also and also I I did a lot of I did about ten years of, of movies, mostly producing, but I was very active as a creative producer. So I was there on set and the editing and and uh, development. But I kind of uh, for me, the nuance of storytelling and character and emotion. I think I was only beginning to understand when I was doing the first Wing Commanders, and it's one of the reasons I went into to film. And there's a certain, uh, it's like the subtlety of performance. It's like you know, I always like to say that you know, it's the reaction shot, it's the shot on the face, not what someone's necessarily saying. It's it's and, and a lot of times as a you know first time director, you're not realizing that because look at a script and it's all dominated by dialogue and so you think oh i got to shoot all this and a lot of times you actually do a lot of coverage on the dialogue but you like one or two takes for a reaction shot and you know can't tell you the amount of times you're in the editing room and you're like stealing a shot that's pre-roll from somewhere because you needed a different look and so i sort of have a much more appreciation of uh differences and nuances and options because i've just seen it when i no matter you know who's directing it or whether i was doing it um i feel like you need that and i also it's just those sort of quieter and more subtle moments and and sort of also letting it breathe you know you've got great people right so like i actually think if i take a look at movies that work and even i know behind the scenes of how it works you know a lot of it's about you know you just have to you, you cast well and you know you let the magic happen you know you don't you're not like going you know you're not going okay you 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 know go up on this and go down on that and blink here and do that it's like you know you you cast someone to be this character so you give them a box and you let them, you know, you, you help them understand where they live in that world, but you let them play with it and let them bring it. And so I'm much more uh, comfortable with that. And, I, you know, I don't know whether maybe it's just also because you know, I have two little kids and so I'm a bit more, it's easier for me to, like, 
deal with older children like us. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> no, I meant it be be more in the moment. You have to be more in the moment with kids. Like you have you have to you can't be in your head. And so in some ways, real real acting is not in your head. I think it's kind of an emotional and it's from your heart. And uh, so you have to be comfortable with that. And I think sometimes that just takes time to get comfortable with. And and so I feel like I'm better at that. Uh, but I, I think that's probably true with everyone. I mean, you see. You know, that's why as actors get older generally they just become it's like fine wine they become better i mean it's in some ways some actors don't even become sort of known or you know like if you think morgan freeman i mean morgan freeman really sort of became morgan freeman much later on in his life and, and I, I think you need that sort of life experience to to bring performances and i think as a director maybe in some ways you have to have some life experience to appreciate appreciate that and uh, and want to have it but you know, that's, maybe that's a bit deep for this animal you know, but there's also the, 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 there's also the thing that because of the complexity of this um, because we are mature actors and, and, and director in a way the only way we can achieve it is is to strip off all the the sophistications that we have learned and just get back to being that very simple mind that a child has again and listen and respond and it, I cannot tell you how refreshing and enjoyable and delightful it is and thanks for having us. No, you're welcome. Thank you for coming here. I'm having a great time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Awesome, 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 awesome. Okay, <laughs> stop that commercial. Okay, so we saw, that was a video that I had not seen before, and I thought it was really cool. I'd seen the uh, individual videos that had been shot with John Rice Davies and uh, Mark Hamill while they were doing all the uh, motion capture work. Uh, but I had not seen this one with Chris and the two of them together, and I thought it was pretty cool to see the relationship that they had, uh, particularly since they had worked on previous projects together uh, of course going all the way back to uh, <laughs> back 20 years ago uh, with Wing Commander which is pr pretty amazing uh, so anyway uh, the last video I'm going to show is the most recent and this one oh, by the way the video that we just watched uh, it was done let me see if I can find exactly because uh, that video like I said that was a video I hadn't seen let's see if I can tell you exactly where it was from um, it was done by Games Rocket, and it's on GameStar. It's, of, of course, it's, it's, it's in German, uh, but you can look it up under Mark Hamill, John Rice davies and Chris Roberts if you're looking for that particular interview. Uh, and then the last one I'm going to do is the one that was just most recently done. Uh, this was published on August 5th. Uh, it was uh, in relation to um, German magazine uh, PC Gamer that uh, went over to the Frankfurt office and um, it Foundry 4, I'm sorry, it, it was Foundry 42, I'm sorry. And these folks got a chance to look at the latest uh, versions of Star Citizen that most of us are kind of anticipating. And uh, they also happened to do a interview with Chris Roberts. Uh, we saw the magazine articles, but they also did this video interview. Some people have just been showing it this weekend. I saw it and I wanted to share it with you guys. So uh, hopefully you guys will dig this. Um, hey, no problem. Um, Mac? Hey, I'm, I'm glad I'm glad you appreciated it. I did too. I hadn't seen that one as well. So let's take a look at this new one from uh, PC Games, okay? Again, guys, thanks for hanging out with me Saturday. Appreciate it. Hope you like this video. Back in the early days. Uh, very early days, uh, the original Elite uh, on the BBC Micro was pretty cool. I was making games on the BBC, and uh, the Elite came out uh, from David Braben and Ian Bell, which was uh, cool. Um, also, um, later on, after uh, Wing Commander had came out, uh, Larry Holland had done the X-Wing and TIE Fighter uh, games, which were uh, very cool, so I like those. Um, so I, I would say those would probably uh, be the ones that weren't my own games that were the ones that I liked the most. I mean, later on there was stuff like Independence War and Free Space, and they were well done, but sort of I, my kind of nostalgia would be more like the late 80s or the early 90s.
Uh, well, I mean, I, so the inspiration for Wing Commander was just essentially watching all these movies growing up as a kid. You know, Star Wars was obviously a, a pretty big one, but TV show like Battlestar, the original Battlestar Galactica, and also, um, you know, films that aren't science fiction, but like Top Gun or whatever, where you sort of, I wanted to be in that movie that I saw. And so that was the whole idea of Wing Commander was to take the cinematic approach uh, and use that to try and put you in this world and universe. So you, made, you felt like you were part of it. So that was a whole point of like, you sit in the cockpit, you can see your hand on the joystick and you're, I mean, it was sort of almost like the first FPS kind of stuff where you can sort of see yourself in the, in the location uh, and using sort of cinematic techniques and motifs to sort of make you uh, feel uh, like you're this hero in this you know, great movie and you're saving the galaxy from the bad guys or whatever it would be. So I, I think uh, the combination of uh, kind of that sort of uh, first person action, which in this case was you know, flying a spaceship and uh, using kind of cinematic storytelling techniques and making it more about the story and the characters and you wanting to you know, sort of succeed uh, in your sort of in in the setup of the story you're in is sort of what I think Wing Commander in the early, if you look back at what Wing Commander does or did back then and you see a lot of games now a lot of the sort of kind of uh, cinematic uh, techniques and the fact that it was more about character and story and less about high score or anything is sort of I would I would say is a lot of the influence Wing Commander had on later games was was that and that was uh, that was kind of my objective I mean I just like movies, I like games, but I wanted the game to be about something more than a high score. And that was one of the big driving factors of Wing Commander. Well, I, I think the, the biggest thing that we're concentrating on right now is the ability of all the players to sort of communicate and work together and sort of be in the same space together. So some of the things that are different with Star Citizen than say some of the games I've done before like Wing Commander is the multiplayer aspect. And it's also the multiplayer aspect in terms of not just you're an in individual ships dogfighting against each other, but you and three or four or six or seven or eight of your friends could all be on one ship operating it together, you know, going wherever down to a planet or down to a space station or getting in a dogfight in an asteroid field and you're sort of doing it together and you can look over to see your friend driving the ship or you can go back and see someone manning a turret. Uh, so that aspect of sort of cooperation and interaction with your friends to do stuff. So a lot of it cooperatively, some of it may be in opposition, but I would say that you would more often than not, even when I see people play the sort of early alpha builds, they're sort of doing things together and it's actually really quite cool. Um, so I think that's a key uh, element to sort of the early fun because we're still at the formative stages of putting the systems in place and the missions and the various kind of gameplays that will give you the structure to exist inside this world. Uh, so that's important to me. And then the other thing is just to make sure that the general game mechanics themselves are simple enough, like whether it's running around on foot shooting a gun like you would in an FPS or flying your ship and getting involved in dogfights or EVAing around. So uh, getting those to be fun and accessible, you know, a combination where they feel like they've got enough nuance and, and uh, complexity where if you really want to concentrate it, you can get good at it and you can be better than someone that's sort of casual, but enough, uh, but not too complicated where you can't, you know, it's too, you know, it's too difficult for someone that, that just has started to get into it. So we're sort of working on those balances. Uh, it's a long process and, and one of the things that's really cool about doing a crowdfunded game is that you sort of get builds out there and you know, it's not perfect or you're trying ideas out and you sort of see how people react to it. Is this fun? Is this easy? You know, is this, is, is this something that people like? And that helps shape sort of your decisions as you're carrying on to develop it. So it's like, it's a really good sort of iterative feedback loop, uh, more so than perhaps you would get in traditional development. Uh, well, I, I mean, it, it's always a challenge. Um, you know, you're never gonna make everyone happy all the time. So what I tell my, what I tell the development teams is to concentrate on what they feel is right and when they're listening to the feedback from the community you should listen to it but you should really sort of only What's going take on, Commander? things that uh, you 
resonate with you, that agree with you. That's the way I look at it. So I, I look at the community that we have, because I, I know there's no way that everyone's going to get the game they want, because it's just impossible, right? I mean, if there's eight of you going to get lunch somewhere, deciding on where to go to lunch is difficult enough. So, you know, you have a thousand people, or a hundred thousand people, or a million people, it just gets worse. Uh, so, the, so, the, so the core for me is that there's a certain kind of game that I want to play as a player, and that's really sort of what we're building in Star Citizen, and I think a lot of people on the development team share that sort of ambition of this style of game. Uh, and then we use the community as a, uh, a really useful sounding board, like to, you know, what, what things are they interested in, or what do they like, or if we give a build, what do they like about it, what they don't like about it, and you use that as, uh, as constructive feedback. The force is with you, you young Skywalker. You don't agree with it. You yet. There's no other way because if you try to please all these different groups, you'll not end up making a very good game. You have to have a pretty consistent vision. And so the way I look at it is, um, you know, stick to Thanks the vision. Thanks for following, bud. Use your community to help guide you along that vision. Um, and uh, you know, you have to have a bit of a thick skin in, in that case because. It's, you know, there's always, you know, I read all this stuff from people like, ah, how are you do this? That's a really stupid, this is crap. And, you know, if you Appreciate read all it, this, Mac. Thinking, well, Don't want to you know, talk over the interview too much, but thank you, Mac. Well, Twiller. But then they did, you know, back and give money to make the game. So obviously they must have done that for a reason. So, but I think that's just the nature of the internet, right? So I do know that like when we uh, do things, um, you know, if there's a particular like issue or outcry and people are upset about stuff, we do try to verify that it really is like something that's a big deal or it's not just five people shouting really loudly because you can get that in today's world. It's in today's world, it's, uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, a small group of people can be very loud and there's a lot of people that usually don't say much. So we do things besides looking at what people say on the forums and Reddit and all the rest of the stuff. We actually look at like kind of what's happening in the game. Like we get telemetry from, you know, how they're playing it, you know, who's winning, who's losing, in terms of like battles, there's this ship overpowered compared to this ship, um, you know, what, what are people doing in the game, watching people play it, and then we use all of that as, uh, as input to help us sort of make the game that we're trying to make, but um, I'm not fooling myself that we're going to please every single one of the backers. Uh, nope, that's not going to please everybody. That's, that's not going to happen. What I do think is we're going to make something that will be cool enough, um, that pretty much everyone hopefully will be happy with it. So it may not have every feature they want, it may not play in some ways the way they want in certain aspects of it, uh, but in the balance of things, it's... Can't please everybody, Chris. I'm hoping that they'll think it's a, you know, a really good game and something they can spend years of venturing around inside. Why are shipped in concept sales still necessary for the project? I mean, well, several things. One, we, we have need money. a big company, right? So, and everybody's just working to make the game bigger and better. Yep. And uh, we sort of gauge uh, the size of the team uh, and kind of like the ambition of what we're doing based on how much money we sort of make every month. So we have a bunch of cash in reserve, uh, but you know, like if we're bringing in a decent amount of new people, because it's more about, it's less about Concept sales help. The force is with ways. you, young Skywalker. But in some ways, it's more about also bringing you on the Jedi yet. Because you know, this is a this is an online game. So what we're actually quite lucky in is that we already have a big community and we're growing the community. So by the time the game is what you would call finished, Commander Shepard, thank you for following. Appreciate that, buddy. To adventure around and have fun inside. Uh, and that's important for an online game because it's sort of the public. Let me stop this for a moment. I don't know if you guys know this, but it's it's weird. It's interesting. Uh, we were talking about this thing about raising money for the game. Uh, a lot of people don't know that um, CIG had actually has backers for the game, actually financial investors who are going to put money up for the game. Uh, but Chris opted to do this uh, GoFundMe style raising or crowdfunding style to show the backers that there was a demand and a need uh, that people would be willing to put up money to have a game 
developed uh, based upon his vision. And so even though people think, oh, these raised $118 million, blah, 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 you have no idea that that money is just the money that has been crowdfunded. He still has financial supporters who are willing to come behind and invest in this game behind the backers, which is actually cool. So when people say, oh, they're running out of money, no freaking way. They're, <laughs> they're not going to run out of money. Uh, the backer money is what's being used up front, and then, of course, the investor money would be brought in later. So just a tidbit of information there. Population and community sort of dictates the success. Um, so part of why we're doing, uh, you know, we, we share the stuff earlier, so bring the community in, the concept sales continue to sort of help. You got that right, not Matt. Not only sort of support some of the ongoing development efforts, but also just the cost of running a live service. So like, it's not, you know, it's not free. I mean, we get Google and Amazon charge us money every month for the No problem, Commander. Thanks file, for stopping through, bro. Uh, for all the servers that distribute the uh, content, like when we do a new patch, you know, we're downloading gigabytes of data to, to every individual person. So it ends up being petabytes of data overall. Uh, so it costs us money to run things continually. So all the builds we give um, backers, uh, turning around, getting the feedback, doing it all, that just costs extra time, costs extra, takes extra, and also takes extra time. Like we have to make those, you know, like work at making those builds as stable as possible, fix the bugs, and of course, we're doing. If our engineers are doing that, they can't be working on new features. So there is a cost involved in running sort of the live game as we are doing now. But again, like I said, I think that is something that makes a, a big difference in terms of the ultimate quality of the game. And things like uh, you know concept sales or new people joining early, um, it's just helping sort of support that as well as sort of create this big feature set. So for instance, you know a good example is you guys were visiting here in the German office and we showed you the procedural planet work that we're doing. And there's no we wouldn't have done that. We wouldn't been able to afford to do that if we had just sort of raised our money and stopped. So that's all part of mm -hmm. kind of the continual fundraising. Uh, we had a stretch goal for R&D uh, into procedural techniques, but that was just R&D. That wasn't promising procedural planets and moons for everything. But now we're going to do that, and we're doing that because we've been able to continue to bring new players in and continue to bring money in, and that new money just gets invested into making the game bigger and richer and deeper. And so that's kind of like my, my objective and goal is I want to make this game as cool as possible. I don't really care about making money. So all the money we can get in is really just about being able to hire the best programmers, the best artists, the best designers. Ooh, you won't hear me say that. Say that. Don't care about making money. <laughs> cooler and bigger world. So, you know, I'm not really going to apologize for the the, the, uh, the the concept sales for that because for me it's just a it's a way to to make the game cooler and bigger. And ultimately, I think everyone at the end of the day uh, will be you know thankful of that. I mean, you just you wouldn't see a publisher invest this kind of money into this game with this much ambition, especially on the PC. Mm -hmm. um, and we're just doing it mostly because it's, there's, there's a community out there and a fan base out there that this is kind of their dream game and they're willing to support it. And I'm really thankful for that because it enables myself and you know, the team here and the team in the other studios to, to deliver that. So it's, it's just all about making the game as cool as possible. And, if, if a few more ships help make it even better, then great. <laughs> yes, Chris, make the game as cool as possible. The game's become bigger and bigger well, right I now. Mean, so, so it's an ongoing, I mean... So oh, that question went by way too fast. I'm sorry, guys, I missed all that question. <laughs> the game has become bigger and bigger right now. How does that influence the further development? Well, I mean, it, so, so it's an ongoing, I mean, so one of the challenges we it's have... It's too close! We're building such a big, ambitious game, and then, of course, in some cases, like the procedural planet stuff that wasn't originally part of the plan, we've you know worked on the technology, we're really happy with it, and then we want to deliver it into the game as soon as possible because we think it's going to provide a huge amount more sort of play experience and opportunities for people to do. Um, it does it does create a bit of a con conundrum because you know when you make something more complicated or bigger, of course, it's going to take a bit more time. Uh, it definitely takes more people uh, and more investment, but uh, you know, expectations in terms of when you're going to get the game. You know, it's like someone from you know back the game in 2012, and we said, well, we're going to have it done, you know, in two to three years' time. Yeah, but we were going to have something that was a lot more. Uh, 
kind of sort of smaller, you mm -hmm. know, more focused in terms of uh, experience you could do, but not have all the extra fidelity and detail that we've been adding into it. Um, you know, if you don't really know the process of building this, you go, why is it, you know, why are some of these things taking as long as they are? And, uh, you know, I mean, the, tr the real answer is if you, you know, the more complicated it is and the bigger and the more ambitious, of course, it's going to take longer. And you really want to spend the time up front to build the systems first rather than retrofit them. So, like, there's two ways we could have done, uh, could have moved forward on, on um, Star Citizen. One would have been to have a much smaller game that doesn't do all the stuff that we're even doing right now in the alpha, because some of the stuff we're doing in the alpha we weren't even promising back in, in the day. Uh, and then just sort of add on additional modules or revisions of the game to get it to the ultimate vision, which is what we're shooting for now. And uh, that's one way to do it. And the other way is to sort of go, okay, well, this is where we're aiming for now, so let's make sure that all the systems that we're building will be able to handle that. And that's kind of the approach we're taking. I'm not necessarily sure which one is uh, you know, better. This is the path we took. You know, if you take a look at Elite Dangerous, ultimately they say their final feature set isn't going to be dissimilar to some of the stuff that we're doing. Uh, but they've started with a much smaller set that they said, okay, this is the finished game. And now we're going to do a season pass. And now we're going to go down and be able to see right. planets and drive around them. And at some point we'll have multi-crew. At some point we'll have FPS. But the problem with that approach is that if you haven't engineered the system to do all those things from the beginning, you have to rebuild stuff mm -hmm. and retrofit stuff, and that can be more difficult and take more time. Um, and people are complaining about like that already. If, you're, you know, if you know you're building a, 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 a castle from the very beginning, you can put, lay the foundations right. But if you just build a little house and then you want to build on these additions to end up to a castle, sometimes you're going to have to knock it all down and start again and build the foundation. So we've sort of taken the latter approach. Like I said, both approaches are valid, uh, which means that in the short run, things to take a little longer to get there. I think in the long run, it will end up with a better experience. And then the challenge for us as, uh, as a developer uh, is to just sort of make sure that we're sharing our progress with the community that's backed us and getting letting them play stuff as we're doing it and getting their feedback with it. So that's kind of what we do. So we invest time and effort and money into doing that. Uh, and I think it will make the game better. Uh, and you know, hopefully we're educating people that game development isn't always quick and isn't always simple. Uh, but <laughs> that's um, the truth. You know, I, you know, I quite like the process and the, the technique that we've taken. And, and my experience with everything, including all the games I've done in the past, is at the end of the day, it counts about the game. So if you know, no one, like everyone will tell you, like, all these people that were, I remember everyone was upset that Uncharted 4 was delayed from, you know, uh, it was meant to be out, you know, previous, you know, last Christmas and they pushed it to earlier this year, right? And everyone was like, Arr! And then, of course, it came out and it was really great and you didn't hear anyone complaining that it was late. They were just saying, oh my God, this game's really great. And I think that's what people really count I mean. And, and from my standpoint, if you invest this much time into making a game, uh, as we are in Star Citizen, and this much effort and this much money, you don't want to say, oh, I've spent five years or four years or whatever it is making this game mm -hmm. and it's not very good. Mm -hmm. and it's the worst thing you possibly could do. So I'd rather take the time. Take the time. Right, because we're also trying to build something that will go on for a long time. Because we're not building a game you're going to play for a week and you're going to be done with it. We're building a universe that you're going to venture around with and hopefully you'll do it for years in the same way that people still play EVE 10 years later. That's what I want to hear. How would you describe the pressure into yourself coming from a project well, I mean, size? Well, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty demanding beast. I mean, the toughest thing is that we have four studios. So we have a studio here in Frankfurt that you're visiting. We have a big studio up in Manchester. Uh, obviously, the uh, office that, uh, you know, the headquarters and where I live is Los Angeles. And we have a studio um, there. And then we have a studio in Austin, Texas. So uh, there's a lot of travel that's involved. I mean, we do a lot of stuff online, so we communicate. You know, we have. Uh, various things like Office 365 and various sort of online collaboration like uh, kind of Confluence and Jira and uh, a whole bunch of other things like Shotgun and we use Skype a lot for video conferencing and IM but nothing beats being in person sort of looking at stuff over people's shoulders having conversations giving them feedback 
Uh, so it just means I do a lot of traveling. So this last year and this year I've been doing a lot, which is kind of tough because you know I have a family, uh, two little daughters, and so you know it's, it's it's a bit of a sacrifice to sort of be apart from them as far as that goes. Um, the other aspect that's kind of tough with the project is just because we're essentially a live project and people are playing the game there, and you know you know you have this big community that want you know. You've given them something, but they want something next month and the month after. So it sort of feels like, uh, you know, you're you're in the magazine world, so you know how it's like. It's you got to publish, you know. If you don't publish, you you die basically. So you have a little bit of that pressure that you wouldn't normally have in a typical like game development. Would be like, okay, here's our project. We're going to work on it for three or four years, and then we're going to show it publicly and announce the date it'll be out, and then everyone sort of crunches to to make that date. But you have quite a while where you're sort of working behind closed doors and you don't have the same sort of public pressure to continue you know, moving forward that you do when you're sort of public the way we are. So those, those are all sort of challenges um, as uh, we sort of move forward to making the game. That's kind of sort of the personal challenge for me is how to spend enough time at the various studios in person because uh, I think that makes a big difference because also on such a big project we have like 320 people you know, a lot of people will just be, you know, they're you know, the person making the weapons or the person working on the flight system. You know, they don't have the big picture, um, you know, and we, you know, do have like higher level sort of various like art directors or lead engineers or lead designers that have a bigger picture. But really, part of my job is also going to all the places, making sure everyone's kind of staying on board with the overall picture and vision of the project making sure that the different teams working on different things are all sort of fitting into that. So, um, you know, in terms of managing and directing a project, it's probably the most challenging one I've ever done. There's nothing I've done that's been of this scale. Uh, and the fact that you're doing it publicly is also, uh, it's always challenging and there's a lot of travel involved. So, uh, you know, that's challenging. So I would say those are kind of the, the sort of the, the personal challenges that come in. But, you know, ultimately, and I've said this before, the, you know, the biggest, um, you know, driver or critic is myself. So like I, I'm making this game because this is a game I want to see happen and see play and I can see a vision very clearly of how the game will work and be and interact. And usually when I'm there, it's like I, I sort of have this obsession of getting it out of my head and seeing it onto the screen. And so, you know, for me, uh, you know, the, like I said, the biggest critic or driver is myself. So if I don't do that, I don't get it from here onto the screen, then I'm angry with myself. And you know, that taking longer than it should, that makes me you know, no, we need to get further, we need to get further. So I would say, you know, probably more of the pressure and stress comes from myself onto myself than you know, or everyone else out there waiting for it. Even though I know they're all very very keen for it, I'm 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 tougher on myself than than, than they are. Um, and I think that's probably what's made me be able to do a lot of the games I've done because, you know, the game, you know, even back in the old days, the Wing Commander was still pretty ambitious and, and complicated. This is much, much more. Uh, but without that sort of, like, stubborn drive to get it from here onto the screen, you know, sometimes you can get overwhelmed with all the work that has to be done. So I don't think that way. I'm like, okay, we're getting here. What do we have to do to get from here to here? And then what do we have to do to get from here to here? And that's the way I think. And that's... So those are, those are the pressures and, and challenges of, of working on Star Citizen. What are the next content updates? Uh, well, you know, obviously you guys are out here visiting. We're giving you a preview of sort of the procedural planet um, technology, which we're going to first um, like share with the, the backers in 2.7. So right now we have 2.4 out, uh, which is the first one that has like persistence. So uh, your character ship will persist between game sessions, which is sort of a standard MMO thing, but obviously in uh, you know a standard sort of online multiplayer shooter like Battlefield or Call of Duty, they don't have that, whereas an MMO does your character, you keep your stats, you know, over sessions and you know what you accumulate and keep over long term. So two four had that. Um, two five, which is the next one patch order out, we bet we have a whole new location that's really for the sort of people that are on the, I don't know, the outside the law, let's put it that way, not necessarily the bad people, um, that's sort of like their version of Port Alasar, which is the space station you're supporting right now in, 
in the Crusader setup, which is the mini PU for us. Um, so that will be there as a new location. So in some ways, you're going to have sort of two factions playing in this sort of multiplayer play space, which I think will be quite interesting. Uh, and then after that, 2.6 um, is uh, the next one up, which uh, we're planning on uh, finally debuting Star Marine. So Star Marine is sort of the... Uh, so we already have FPS in the game. You can play it already. Star Marines yeah. finally coming out. Uh, a lot of folks have been waiting on that. that uh, but Star Marines sort of a dedicated game, though, just like Arena Commander is the dogfighting. So you know, outside the persistent universe, you want to test your FPS skills and just come in with some other players in a sort of contained area or map. You can do that the same way that Arena Commander lets you test your dogfighting skills. And inside our world, they're, they're, you know, they're sort of games with inside games, like a, a fictional game that you can play inside, uh, inside the universe of Star Citizen. Uh, but we thought it was quite important to have that because we've been working a lot on the FPS mechanics, techniques, and some stuff that will go with that that people haven't seen yet, uh, in terms of sort of controls and smoothness and movement and, and, and kind of how the weapons feel. And, uh, that we felt like we wanted to get it out there so people could play sort of multiplayer FPS sessions, uh, sort of learn the weapons and how to do that and also do it in a manner that they don't have to fly a distance and hope there'll be some other people in this area for them to sort of fight with. Um, so that, that will be sort of 2.6 and then 2.7, which is the one after that, is the one that will have uh, the first iteration of the procedural planets. Uh, we're starting to lay out Stanton, which is the, the uh, star, first star system that we're going to be giving players. Right now, players uh, are playing uh, in a portion of the Stanton system around this gas channel called Crusader, uh, and they start on Port Olasar, which is the space station that's outside that. But none of the planets, um, you know, you can't actually go to the planet and land and walk around the planet, whereas with the procedural planets, you'll be able to do that. Um, and uh, so that's a big, big step. There's a huge amount more sort of playable content. Uh, and 2.7 will sort of have the beginnings of that, which will have at least one of the landing locations, uh, the Levski landing location. Uh, and then, you know, obviously Port Olisar and the, the pirate outlaw base, which is called Grim Hex. And a lot of the sort of planets and moons will be real ones you can go land on. And then over the next few releases, we'll be sort of fleshing out the other landing areas, like Arc Corp, will not be a standalone. It will be on the proper planet in the Santon system, and uh, you know Microtech and Hurston, which are the other two sort of landing locations in the Santon system, along with lots of space stations. And so our goal is to get the Santon system fully sort of functioning, where you can go between these locations, take jobs, make money, buy, sell equipment, ships, um, interact with other players come across, uh, you know, NPC, AI, um, you know, defend yourself against them, attack them, depending on who they are, uh, rob things for them if you want to be a pirate, whatever. So that's, that's kind of the goal for us, and that's sort of, the, that's sort of the, the, the path. Once we have Stanton working, then we're going to start to um, bring on other star systems online, but we want to get this uh, whole kind of player ecosystem working in Stanton first, where it's a bit more contained. Um, and during the process of that, we'll be bringing on other sort of background features like you know I mentioned uh, earlier this morning we were talking about some of the stuff we're doing on the network where we're going to have this sort of mesh of servers so we'll be able to have hopefully you know a large amount of players all in the same area so we don't have to instance it in the way that originally we were thinking we we're going to have to instance it we have a kind of different server design now that could potentially have thousands of players all in the same sort of area um, at the same time which um, would be really cool because that's something that again it's not something that you could get a while, you know, a year ago or ten years ago, but you know, with sort of the newer tech, the power of the machines, uh, kind of some of the stuff you can do in the cloud, the possibility is sort of opened up, and we want to utilize it. How will players experience all the lore and history in the universe of Star I think Citizen? One of the points we were making earlier, when we were sort of showing the procedural tech for the planets, is really how it sort of. Uh, built to be artist, authored, and driven. And the reason why we're doing that is the whole approach in Star Citizen is to sort of have a designed universe, right? So we've created a lore and a history for this universe. Uh, and we have, you know, very specific, we don't want to sort of just procedurally randomly generate these planets and 
you know, they just or whatever comes out of the magic formula. We want to say no. In this system, like in the case of say Stanton, that where you know the the you know the first star system we're going to let players play in, you know, there's four specific planets that have been sort of bought or taken over by the different corporations. So Art Corp, Hurston, um, Crusader, and and uh, Microtech are big big corporations that are part of the law of of Star Citizen itself, and this is a system that UEE sort of sold the star, the different planets to these various uh, companies, and these companies are sort of like almost like company, you know, like in the old days they would have these company towns, whether it would be you know in England or America or probably over here in Germany too, uh, but this is sort of like a company planet, right? Um, and so uh, they're very like designed, like you know, like a Microtech is a sort of uh, it's the furthest out from the sun, so it's a cold planet. Snow, ice, you know, think of it like Hoth, uh, say in Star Wars. Uh, whereas Hurston <coughs> is, a, is a, Hurston is a planet that's um, over, you know, it's been basically uh, over industrialized, it's polluted, you know, they've stripped all the natural resources from it, so it's, you know, it's like covered in smog and, you know, basically they've poisoned the planet because they've run their factories and smelting, uh, uh, you know, uh, or and the whole stuff is just it's sort of almost like I don't know where you want to call it like a industrial hell on earth um, and then and Crusader they have their sort of platforms building the ships floating above the gas giant so there's very specific looks and feels of it uh, and it's all driven by the universe and the law so we've sort of we're building and constructing the whole game along that way so it should feel like the history and the you know the setup of the universe should just come across as you're moving across. The factions um, that are set up, that we've set up in the history, will be in the game. Uh, you know, there'll be a combination of uh, sort of procedurally generated missions based on what's happening in the economy that will provide uh, opportunity for you as a player or AI to take if a player isn't taking it and just create sort of ongoing commerce and, and activity in the, in the, in the universe. Uh, and then there will be also specific sort of more crafted uh, story uh, missions sprinkled in there to give a sense of identity and character and narrative uh, to the world itself. So the, the idea is hopefully like it'll have a very strong identity. You know, when you're on certain planets that we've described in you know, our various you know, pieces of lore on the, the website, you'll really feel that. I mean, you'll feel this like it's a real universe, a real world. When you go down, you should be able to sort of almost sort of taste the air, basically. And, and, uh, and, and everything, all our design decisions are based around being able to deliver that. I mean, we, we're very consistent. Like, we have all these different ships. We have different manufacturers uh, for spaceships. That each manufacturer has certain styles and background and history is the same on weapons. If you go around here later on, I think we'll you know, stop by with the sort of weapons team is here. And you know, so the bearing, like personal FPS weapons, have a very specific style that will be different than a different manufacturer, say A and R or someone like that. Um, so we're really trying to, from the bottom up, build a constructed, tangible, real world um, that that sort of feels like it's been crafted. Well, I'm basically remaking Wing Commander with uh, Squadron Forty Two. I mean, it's it's very it's a uh, it's very much in the sort of flavor of how, how I would have done a Wing Commander. Um, so it's kind of hard to say. I mean, you know, Wing Commander is something that, you know, be a lot of fun to go back and uh, make using the modern techniques. Uh, but again, I'm, that is pretty much Squadron 42, is I'm essentially doing what I would have done for a next, you know, a new version of Wing Commander, but obviously in this newly created universe and world. Uh, so it'd be kind of hard to say because the other aspect is, you know, Star Citizen itself is kind of like taking Privateer and Freelancer, but, you know, going a lot further than any of those did, but it's the same general kind of idea of building a sort of constructed world that you would venture around inside. But of, of course, it's in the Star Citizen universe and has a lot more fidelity and, you know, a lot more ambition. Um, so I guess I could say that I'm kind of remaking, uh, you know, quite yep. a few of my old games all at once, all inside Star Citizen. Um, so, and even as we showed today, flying over the, the planet, you could, you know, almost feel like it was Strike Commander too. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, the only thing I, I, I'm probably not doing is remaking, uh, like, Tangelore, which was a fantasy-based game. Uh, but, yeah, yeah, I mean, 
start, the whole Star Citizen setup is pretty much like taking a whole bunch of different games and putting it inside one and having you be able to do whatever you want. Very cool. Very, very cool. Um, I uh, definitely hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, again, if you guys have any questions about anything in relation to Star Citizen, um, hey, this is a good time to drop it on me. Um, <laughs> um, th there's so much that's been going on recently in relation to um, I'm going to turn this down here uh, in relation to um, what's going on we've got GamesCon coming up in I think a week or a week or two and Mac hey thanks for hanging out with me bro um, GamesCon's coming up in just over a week and then we've got CitizenCon coming up in October and there's just a whole lot um that um, has been buzzing about Star Citizen. Uh, it's been a long time coming, but we really think there's going to be some exciting stuff released at both GamesCon and CitizenCon. Uh, a lot of folks who are in the know or who have their ears to the ground believe that uh, at both of these conventions uh, there will be major announcements made. Uh, one of the largest ones will probably be uh, at CitizenCon in October, where hopefully we will hear a release date uh, for Squadron 42 the single player multiplayer game that uh, they've been working on uh, for the past three and a half years and uh, I'm, I've got my ticket already, I've got my airline ticket, I've got my rooming buddies and I'm really excited about heading out to uh, Hollywood, California uh, for Citizen Con in October. Uh, it's, tickets are already sold out so if you guys want to go you can have to work it out with somebody who can give you a ticket but uh, I'm really looking forward to it and hopefully uh, we will hear some really positive news. I know we're going to hear some good stuff but hopefully something like a release date would be the ultimate whether it be um, end of the quarter of this year or beginning of first quarter in 2017. Um, Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the videos and you got to hear some things from Chris Roberts all the way back from 2012 when this whole idea of Star Citizen got formed all the way until just, just past week uh, with the interview that was done with PC Gamer, uh, which a lot of people were very excited about. Uh, we're looking for Update 2.5 to be released, uh, hopefully within the next week. Uh, I know Chris the other day uh, when he was on Around the Verse was hoping that uh, it would be ready by this weekend. And the weekend's not over. Uh, Star Citizen's guys work over the weekend a lot of times, so we may see a push of an update. But if not today, we'll probably see it on Monday or Tuesday of next week. Uh, but a lot of folks are anticipating that release and uh, a lot of new things such as Grim Hex, uh, the re release of the uh, Reliant Core, the Argo uh, utility ship, and a lot of other things that are going to be coming out. New Wardrobe, uh, Grim Hex, which is out um, in the uh, yellow uh, asteroid belt. A whole lot of cool stuff going to be coming out. Uh, so there's a lot to look forward to with Star Citizen. And uh, no questions have popped up on screen, so I guess you guys are all knowledgeable. You know what's going on. Uh, once again, hey, this is Griffin Gaming RPG. Uh, definitely appreciate you hanging out with me this morning and this afternoon as we heard from Chris Roberts and learned a little bit more about the Star Citizen universe. Um, definitely, if you aren't a follower, hey, feel free to hit that follow button. You can also follow me on Twitter at the same name, Griffin Gaming RPG. And uh, hope you guys have a real good weekend, and hopefully, we will see you around in the verse. Take care, guys. Have a good weekend.